So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for tuning in this uh, new um, Mediterranean dialogue. Uh, this time we have the pleasure to welcome with us in this initiative uh, led by ISPI, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, African Cooperation and Moroccan expatriates from the Kingdom of Morocco, Mr. Nasser Bourita. I will be uh, joined by uh, Viviana Mazza, uh, who's a journalist at Corriere della Sera, um, in this uh, dialogue with, uh, with the minister, where we will have the opportunity to cover many of the issues that are of importance, not only to Morocco, but to the region as a whole uh, in these times of, of pandemic. Before we start with the dialogue and the discussion with the minister, I would uh, like to ask a very uh, initial question on, on what the minister considers that are um, the main priorities currently of Moroccan foreign policy, and in particular, how has the pandemic affected the diplomacy of uh, the Kingdom of Morocco? So, Minister, thank you very much for joining this discussion. The floor is yours for an initial remark. Thank you very much, and I, I'm very happy to be with you for the first time in the Rome Dialogue. And I would like to thank uh, my friend Luigi Di Maio for this invitation. I think such occasions are very important because in, uh, in these challenging times and in these difficult uh, periods, it is important to uh, have uh, an open-minded discussion and uh, the passionate uh, exchanges and even out of the box reflections on the challenges we are facing uh, now. And I think this opportunity within the mid, uh, the raw mid dialogue is, is very important. Uh, the Moroccan diplomacy, of course, will, uh, will face the same challenges uh, many diplomacies are facing in this post COVID era. Uh, but at the same time, we have some specificities because of our uh, geographical position. We are Arabs with many challenges facing the Arab world. We are part of the North Africa and the Maghreb, and we have challenges in our region, including Libya. We are African with all the opportunities and challenges the African continent is facing. We are Mediterranean, and we think that the COVID-19 has given, uh, has challenged the, 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 the concept of neighborhood uh, and uh, the EU uh, neighborhood policy. And of course, because of our position, because of our history, we are active on many global uh, challenges, migration, the fight against terrorism, climate change, et cetera. And we have, of course, uh, our territorial integrity as a main uh, priority for our diplomacy. So uh, the Moroccan diplomacy will, uh, will deal with these challenges uh, related to its geographical position, to its... Uh, in a commitment to some global uh, issues, uh, but also how to ca we can help and contribute to, um, to face the post-COVID era for our economy and for our society. Well, thank you very much, Minister. I am sure we will have the occasion to come back to many of the issues that you um, brought um, in, the, in your introductory remarks. I would like to start with a, the with a first question um, relating, uh, related to your diplomacy towards Africa, as you uh, rightly pointed out. Um, of course, uh, Morocco has been uh, very active. Um, in uh, what some people have called the diplomacy of face masks. But I would also dare to say the diplomacy of the provision uh, of, of equipment uh, to many African countries um, that have been uh, affected by the pandemic. And that, of course, not only has been a, a key development for Moroccan diplomacy, but also for the industry of the country that has reconverted to a large extent to the provision of uh, and the production of, uh, of these goods. Um, the question is, how has the pandemic changed 
Morocco's relations uh, with uh, the African continent, and to what extent is in this um, uh, diplomatic attention towards Africa, uh, there is also an increasing interest by Morocco to look uh, towards the South, to have an active ge geopolitical engagement towards uh, the region and what are the main challenges in that regard? Uh, I think the relation between Morocco and Africa is, um, is not related to a particular uh, juncture. Morocco is African. Morocco is part of the African continent. Uh, the, the history of Morocco is linked to, to Africa. Uh, the uh, uh, the destiny of Morocco is linked to that of the African continent. His Majesty uh, the King was clear when he said that uh, the future of Morocco is linked to the future of the African continent. So that's why, and based on this uh, vision of His Majesty, Morocco has developed an African policy, which is uh, first with a personal commitment of the King himself. His Majesty visited uh, Africa 50, more than 50 times, uh, more than 22 countries. And uh, Morocco has developed an offer which is not, I, think, I, I don't think it can be compared to any other offer towards the African continent, because it is first uh, uh, based on a religious dimension. We know that in many African countries, even Islam was introduced by, uh, through Morocco and by Moroccans. Uh, Morocco is today training many imams from the, and uh, religious leaders from the African continent. And uh, uh, His Majesty has established a, a foundation for uh, religious leaders in, uh, in, uh, in Islam. Uh, in, the, in the African continent. So there is this religious dimension. There is also uh, a human dimension. Morocco is training every year more than 10,000 African uh, youth in the Moroccan schools and universities. And uh, today, if there is uh, a presence of Morocco in the continent, it's because Morocco has many friends, many people who are today leaders in Africa have been trained in the Moroccan uh, schools and in the Moroccan uh, universities and training centers. Uh, it has a, a military and security component through years and Moroccan uh, soldiers are today present in Central African Republic. They are in the RC and have been in Angola, have been in many African countries. And of course, it has an economical dimension uh, Morocco today is one of the major, if not maybe the first, uh, African investor in Africa. We are for sure the first in Central and uh, Western Africa. And uh, we are second or maybe even the first in the whole continent. Uh, the, the Moroccan banks, the Moroccan uh, insurance companies, the Moroccan uh, uh, business community is present in most of the African continent. So, uh, and this policy is based on an Afro-optimism. Morocco thinks that Africa is the continent of the future. Africa is facing challenges, of course, but Africa has many assets. Uh, its demography is an asset. Uh, it's the, the vitality of its society is an asset. And the economical opportunities it is offering is an asset. You know that Every year, more than 30 million Africans are acceding to the uh, middle class uh, with all what uh, this means in terms of a uh, uh, model of uh, consumption and the uh, way of life, etc. So uh, we think that Africa is uh, a continent of opportunity. So Afro-optimism is the first uh, thing. The second is solidarity. And Morocco has been in solidarity with the African continent on, during the, the, all its, its history. We are with Africa when it comes to stability. We are with Africa when it comes to uh, natural uh, 
disasters or and we are in Africa when it comes to uh, facing global challenges. During the COVID, uh, His Majesty decided that uh, Morocco can support, can share what we are locally producing with more than 25 African uh, countries. We have sent uh, masks, we have sent ventilators, we have sent uh, all the uh, PPEs which were pr produced in Morocco were shared with the African continent. And because Morocco and His Majesty believes that Africa can rely on itself and South-South cooperation cannot just be uh, slogans or a diplomatic uh, statement. South-South uh, cooperation and Afro-African cooperation can help Africa solving many of its uh, problems. So uh, that's why this policy is not about a particular period it's a strategy, a long-term strategy, based on clear uh, vision, and which will uh, continue in the in the future with the same things: offer optimism and solidarity to face the challenges. Thank you, Minister. I will give the floor to Viviana Mazza now. Viviana, your mic. Sorry. <laughs> Minister Burita, um, uh, one of the things you mentioned, uh, Morocco as the cornerstone of regional cooperation in areas including the fight against irregular, irregular migration, uh, leads me to ask you this question. Um, in Western Sahara, uh, and especially from the city of Dakla, uh, we've seen that um, this has become a, a new route of immigration uh, to the Canary Islands and, and so to Europe, um, despite this area being uh, patrolled by and controlled by Morocco, um, there has been this uh, really big increase. Um, according to an El Pais article last year, uh, 2,700 arrivals from Africa were registered in the Canary Islands. This year, there are 18,300 undocumented migrants, half of whom are, are Moroccans. So I would like to ask you what are the difficulties in, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, in the fight against irregular, irregular migration there. And also in Western Sahara, we have seen uh, the end of, a cease, of the ceasefire three weeks ago. And I would, like you, uh, I would like to ask you if it is possible to conceive one day a solution for this disputed area uh, that is acceptable to both Morocco and the Polisario Front. Thank you. Uh, two parts in your question. The first one is on uh, migration. I think the uh, policy of, of Morocco on migration is very clear. It is based on three principles. The first one is that uh, Morocco is, believes in shared responsibility of all those involved in, uh, in migration, countries of origin, countries of transit, and countries of destination. And it's not for the countries of transit to bear the whole burden of, of migration. Uh, the strategy should be, uh, should include the three uh, components. The second principle is that we should have uh, a concrete cooperation uh, with our neighbors. And this is what we are doing with Spain mainly. And we, between Morocco and Spain, I think there is a success story in terms of uh, dealing with migration and uh, the, the Western route uh, was one of the most controlled one because of this very good cooperation between Morocco and, and Spain. And the third one is that uh, Morocco will never be the gendarme of anyone in dealing with migration. Morocco is, will take its responsibilities, but uh, Morocco will also be frank and clear uh, in asking everyone to take it's its responsibility. You have talked about this, uh, let's say, new route going from uh, the southern provinces of Morocco uh, to uh, to the Canary Island. I think it shows that also the traffickers, the human traffickers, are adapting themselves. Uh, when when a route is well controlled, they are trying to adapt and to go to 
uh, a new one. And this is what is happening now. And uh, Morocco and Spain uh, have been in contact and concrete actions have been taken uh, to uh, stop this road at the beginning. Uh, like Morocco did in the north, the western parts between uh, uh, through the Mediterranean, uh, which, which was why, while Europe was suffering from the pressure from the central road through Libya and the uh, eastern one, this road has been uh, the most uh, well controlled because of the action of Morocco and because of the efforts uh, of Morocco. And I think it's through dialogue, through genuine cooperation, through a better understanding uh, that uh, we can face it. And Morocco and Spain are in that spirit. And that's why I think the uh, contacts have been made between uh, me, the foreign minister, the minister of interior and his colleague to uh, uh, start a cooperation also in this, uh, in this area. Uh, the, and Morocco is dealing with this route uh, from Dakhla to uh, to the uh, to the Canarias uh, Islands, like it is the, dealing with the one from the north through the Mediterranean, both are parts of the Moroccan territory, and both Morocco is dealing as a responsible and loyal uh, uh, partner. The second part of your um, question related to the issue it, uh, uh, itself of the, the regional dispute over the Moroccan Sahara. We think that uh, first, uh, what happened is, uh, was very uh, clear and simple. It has, uh, uh, there, were, there was some uh, disturbance in the circulation between Morocco and Mauritania caused by the militia from Polisario. Morocco took its responsibilities uh, after the Security Council, the Secretary General and many countries have called Polisario uh, to stop this, uh, this provocation. And Morocco took its responsibility in a peaceful way. And today the circulation uh, is resuming normally. And many countries, many organizations have uh, uh, recognized that Morocco has dealt with it with uh, restraint, with professionalism and uh, uh, responding to what the UN Secretary General and the UN Security Council has called for, which is a free circulation of people and of uh, goods between Morocco and Mauritania. Now on the, uh, and Morocco has said from the beginning that it is still committed to the ceasefire and Morocco is still committed to the peace, uh, to the peace process led by the United Nations. His Majesty mentioned that directly to the Secretary General during a, a call phone uh, three weeks ago. So we are committed to the ceasefire, but we will react to any aggression coming from a non-state military uh, actor uh, and its militia. Now on the, uh, on the substance of the issue itself, I think the Security Council has been clear. The last Security Council resolution uh, in its operative paragraph two was clear a call for a pragmatic, implementable, lasting solution, which is based on compromise. This is exactly what Morocco is calling for. The Security Council has called the parties, including Algeria, to engage in this round table mechanism to achieve this solution. Morocco is for a realistic solution, a realistic solution which will put aside all the options which are unrealistic. Second, a pragmatic solution. Morocco is pragmatic and Morocco is looking for a solution which will be a face saving for everyone. Three, a lasting one. And uh, any option, any mechanism which will not allow uh, a lasting solution uh, will, will not be on the table. And Morocco thinks that its autonomy plan is responding to this four criteria set out by the Security Council. It is pragmatic, it is uh, uh, future uh, or uh, uh, forward looking, it is implementable and it will ensure a lasting solution. What we need is that uh, the other parties 
will uh, agree to the same principles and engage in this process on the basis of uh, the autonomy plan, which is for Morocco the only possible solution to this original dispute. Dear Minister, thank you. We're running out of time now, but uh, I would like to ask uh, another question and then I will give it the last uh, question to, to Viviana for closing. But um, I would like to bring you to the Euro-Mediterranean relations. Um, of course, we all know that the objectives of uh, the Euro-Mediterranean partnership have not been fulfilled in its totality. Integration still and cohesion across both shores of the Mediterranean are um, still a big challenge, but also because um, there are plenty of internal rivalries, uh, regional rivalries within um, uh, in, the, in, in, in Northern Africa that also make uh, and pose difficulties uh, when uh, achieving the full potential of uh, regional integration. At the same time, as you rightly mentioned at the, at the beginning of, of, your, of, your, um, of your remarks, uh, Africa is uh, getting uh, more um, or is putting more emphasis into free trade within the African continent. My question is blunt uh, and, and direct. Do you think that um, what Euro-Mediterranean relations have not fully achieved so far can be achieved instead by more free trade within the African country? And if so, where does this leave Euro-Mediterranean relations for the years to come? I think it's not um, in terms of this or that. Uh, Morocco as an African and Euro-Mediterranean uh, country believes that the uh, progress in, in the integration in the African continent, the uh, African uh, free trade uh, area will be, an ele will be elements which could help for the development of the African continent and will help uh, boost this South-South cooperation. The Euro-Mediterranean relations I think we have, we have some achievements. We have just celebrated the 25th anniversary of the Barcelona process. And I think it has framed the, 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 the relations. We have some progress in terms of uh, association agreements, in terms of political dialogue, in terms of uh, uh, also some uh, accession to some programs, some European programs by Southern Mediterranean uh, countries. But at the same time, I think the post-COVID area should question the neighborhood policy. Uh, the COVID has uh, challenged many of the concepts, including the neighborhood. When, when, when we had the COVID, uh, the cooperation between neighbors, Morocco and Spain, or Morocco and France, uh, has been very positive, And it has shown the value of, of neighborhood. And that in the future, it's with this unpredictable crisis we may be facing in the, in the future, securing and having a, a, a good partnership with the, with the neighborhood is important. We still believe that for the EU, it is important to make the difference between the geographically European Union, the political or institutional European Union, and the geopolitical European Union. We think we cannot, we are not part of the institution, we are not part of the geography, but we should be part of the geopolitical uh, European Union. When the EU should think about its future, about its uh, positioning geopolitically, it should integrate the Southern Mediterranean region as a part of its thinking. Uh, the, uh, uh, we should be uh, involved in the decision shaping when decisions will be taken soon I, I, on the carbon taxes, taxes or on uh, uh, the climate change, you will impact us. And the, uh, the, the EU should create this space where its neighbors could be part of the decision uh, making, where they could have the ownership of some of the actions and decision which will impact them. So we think that we have some assets in our region, in the Euro-Mediterranean region. We have some challenges, but we need sometimes to change the paradigms and the, 
the, the software in dealing with, with such problems. If I take the relation between Morocco and Spain or Morocco, uh, particularly Morocco and Spain, we have a model where we can find elements of convergence, how we can cooperate and deal with uh, uh, common challenges, migration, fight against terrorism, co-development, etc. Uh, the, the Mediterranean uh, region should not be within the EU, only the concern of some Mediterranean countries. It should be the concern of the whole uh, members of the European Union. Viviana, now the, the floor the floor is yours for our last question. Thank you very much, Minister, from my side. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, uh, yes, uh, we don't have much time, but um, just in closing, um, we have talked about the pandemic and its impact. And um, in many regions, in many um, states in the Middle East and North Africa, we have seen in 2011 uh, the so-called Arab Spring protests. And then, you know, more recently in some countries, um, these protests continued. And I would like to ask you if you expect uh, more protests in the, in the region um, linked to economic problems that are now exacerbated by the pandemic. Uh, I think the, uh, the, ch the challenges uh, uh, caused by the COVID-19 are the same everywhere. And I think also that uh, it has put some pressure on the economical and social system, maybe more on some countries than on the other. But uh, if we consider protest as a way of express expressing some um, request, within legitimacy, it's the same in Europe. And we have seen during the last years that many European countries were also facing uh, protests and still are facing protests, including some, uh, some European Mediterranean countries. So I think uh, uh, when uh, there is a space where uh, requests are expressed and where there is a, a strong legitimacy, I think that uh, expressions of uh, of, uh, of requests is not is cannot be seen as a danger south and as a normal expression north. I think uh, we think that the policies taken by my, by many countries and I hear um, for Morocco uh, there, there is a, a program for the recovery of the economy with 15 billion dollars, most uh, uh, something like 11% of our GDP, which will be integrated in, in the economy. This will use the post-COVID era as an opportunity, not as a real challenge. Uh, our industry has shown during the COVID its ability to adapt. And we think the resilience of this economy will be an asset for the post-COVID era. era. I think what is important is not, uh, of course, there are, there, there are pressure, there will be pressure, social and economical one, but I think the anticipation, the responses of countries uh, uh, should also uh, and will also be uh, positive in this regard. Thank you very much, Minister Burita, for being with us. Um, thank you for those who have followed us and thank, thank you to my co-chair, uh, Paul Morillas. Um, I wish you all a good continuation with the program of MAD. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.